goods. Um, welcome and good morning to this, the 12th and final meeting of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee um, of 2016. Can I make the usual request that mobile phones are switched off? Um, or on to uh, flight mode. Um, agenda item one is a decision on taking business in private, and our first item of business today is to consider whether to take correspondence from the Commission of Parliamentary Reform and review of our work programme in private and future meetings. Our committee agreed to do that? Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, moving on to agenda item two, which is a substantive piece of work today, which is on the draft budget. Uh, and the focus of our evidence today is to hear from the Funding Council, um, which provides funds to 19 universities in Scotland. And we will be hearing from the Scottish Government a bit later this morning, too. Um, I'm delighted to have on the panel with us this morning Dr John Kemp, who is the Interim Chief Executive, and Fiona Burns, who is Assistant Director Access and Outcome Agreements Management at the Scottish Funding Council. Good morning. Morning. And thank, thank you for, for joining us the, this morning. Uh, you'll have a, a clear insight into, because we're almost at the end of our budget scrutiny now, of, of, of where we've been go, going with this and the issues that we've, we've been looking at. We've obviously been looking at the budget as inequalities, um, it, with, with inequalities focus, and the issue we've been looking at is wi widening access, specifically for people with disabilities and people who use BSL as their first language. Um, John, I think maybe I'll, I'll, I'll kick off with you first, if you don't mind, because I think one of the things we need to set the scene, I think, from the Funding Council is about outcome agreements yep. and how outcome agreements come about and where you are in that process, because I think you're just at the stage where you're renewing them now. That's uh, right. And what aspects of those, what those outcome agreements would mm. require universities to ensure that they have widened access, and it's not just about some of the, you know, the softer aspects of disabilities, it's, it's maybe some of the, yep. the, the more complex aspects as well, John. Okay. Um, now, outcome agreements were introduced um, around about four years ago, um, and they were a way of linking the funding that we give to, to universities and to colleges too, there's a very similar system in colleges, um, with, with priorities from the government and, and, and from the SFC, and you know, that very much includes widening access, um, in, you know, including widening access for people with disabilities. Well, we issue guidance to universities on what we would like to see in um, an outcome agreement, um, and that contains you know, some measures that we would want them to use um, in, in demonstrating how they're meeting priorities. On um, disabilities you know, that, and other protected characteristics, we asked, we, what we used to do was ask them to reflect on the, the protected characteristics where there was an imbalance in their institution and where the, we, we, they felt and we agreed they needed to take action and then reflect that in the outcome agreement. In recent years, um, in the most recent guidance, we, we firmed that up a bit because it used to be that institutions very much could pick and choose you know, whether a particular protected characteristic would lead to a measure in their outcome agreement. And we, we felt that that you know, needed to be firmed up a bit more in the current guidance so that um, there was more of a, an impetus on them looking at all the protected characteristics and being clear of that. So the, the, the latest guidance um, is a bit clearer on that point that we want them um, to demonstrate that they are looking at all the protected characteristics and, and, and taking um, the, the correct action. So the outcome agreements that are being negotiated now, and Fiona is an outcome agreement manager as, as well as um, head of access, um, are ones for 17, um, um, well, 17 to 18, but also probably in most cases the subsequent two years. They have a slightly different set of guidance from the ones we've had up until now. Um, we have the the early drafts of those outcome agreements in, but we haven't finalised those with institutions. That's done after the budget setting process. So, in summary, I suppose outcome agreements are very much a way of linking them, you know, the shared priorities that government, the funding council, and others have on equalities um, with and other things um, with the funding we give to universities. <coughs> One of the things that, that we've picked up quite quite clearly is um, in some universities there's a big bigger focus on equalities than others. And you're right about when you drill into that, what, what, does, what does that actually mean? Um, and I know that the Funding Council took a very proactive role in the summer about gender balance at, in, in, in colleges and universities. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering how, how, you, how you could, you know, incorporate much, much more closely to, to some of the 
the outcome agreements, what's required of universities in order to provide access to people who maybe have, have uh, different or complex needs. It seems to be, for the evidence that we've heard, that you know, if the, there's very good provision if you've got dyslexia, for instance. Yes. But if you've got yes. something that's a bit more complicated, um, whether that's you know physical access to a building, yeah. for some universities that that's posing to, to be a problem for others, it, yeah. it's not. Um, or for people in particular, one of the aspects we learned is people who use uh, British Sign Language as their first first language. Yeah. Um, so I, I suppose what we are looking at is how how do we ensure that the policy you know going forward. Okay. Uh, creates the opportunities for, yeah. for people to have, have that access that they need. Yeah. Um, well, you, you referred there to the Gender Action Plan, um, which we launched in the summer. And, and perhaps that is the kind of approach that we, we need um, um, on, on other protected characteristics, but in, in this case, particularly disability, because I, there are areas of very good um, provision um, in, in the universities, and, and, you know, and there are some cases where, you know, where they have you know, picked up the issue and are you know, running with it themselves. But you're, you're correct, and it comes out of the, you know, the evidence that the committee has had submitted um, as part of this investigation, that it, that it's a mixed picture, that some, um, some particular disabilities and some particular institutions, the story is less good. Um, so... It's maybe perhaps something that we in the Funding Council need to reflect on, how we um, give a bigger push to making the best things you know, more common across the sector um, and ensuring that you know, some of the more tricky issues... And, and, and we have to acknowledge they are tricky. Sometimes you're dealing with quite small numbers and so on, and that's part of the reason that you know, a lot of the, the action is perhaps on dyslexia and so on, it, is that, that is, you know, there are big numbers in dyslexia in a way that there aren't in some of the, the other um, groups. So I think we need to think about how we um, give a renewed push um, to you know, this particular aspect of equalities and, and making sure that it's, it's something that is at the forefront of institutions' minds um, as we refresh outcome agreements. Now, the current guidance, I think, does a bit of that, um, but I would accept that you know, there, there are other things that could be done. Yeah, very key things that we heard last week and the week before was about um, the differences even between schools within uh, and faculties within uh, universities as well. And, and one aspect that I had uh, spoken to some of the, the universities about last week was about staff training and whether that staff training was mandatory mm -hmm. and what was the take-up like and there was a, an admission yeah some people go on staff training but a, a lot don't especially yeah. a qualities training or specific yeah. you know training around about specific disabilities like BSL um, and I wondered whether there's any space in the outcome agreements to ensure that you know elements of staff training like that but become mandatory because some of the evidence that we've had in written evidence seems to be about academic staff not really the ethos of the yeah. the the, um, mm -hmm. the institution institution or the student bodies or whatever but it seems to be maybe direct one-to-one -one academic staff yeah. and in my mind you know that can be fixed quite easily with a decent staff training program but it needs to be mandatory yeah um the and i accept that that would that, that would be a useful way forward the the challenge for the funding council is we have outcome agreements which we try and keep um as you know, strategic documents that are agreed with the institution um and the question would be whether the most appropriate way to, to, to make staff training you know, more mandatory and get more of it is through the outcome agreement or, th or some other method. Now, I think what we in the Funding Council can do through the outcome agreement is, is focus on, on the outcomes that we want from that. Um, I would be slightly resistant to be too specific in the outcome agreements about um, numbers of staff doing training, because actually one of the risks is you can you can put measures in an outcome agreement that um, you know, don't actually tell you how much um, that is affecting um, your students and so on. So I, I, I'm very open to the point that you know, staff training is part of the solution, and we need to look at ways of making sure that it's happening. Um, we need to think about how we put that in the outcome agreements in a way that's meaningful and doesn't lead to just loads of numbers about people who've been on training, but not necessarily looking at what outcome that's having for students. Yeah. Okay, thank you, John. Yeah. Um, Fiona, do you want to add anything? Um, just reflecting on that point, we undertook a, quite a full review of the college system um, and their what was called extended learning support funding. And the main finding that came out from all of that was essentially it's people that help 
people, and that's where you will get the biggest impact in terms of any finance that you put in to help people with disabilities. And also another finding that came out from that was that sometimes the complexity of conditions that are being presented, particularly in the, the college system, um, mean that kind of ongoing training is absolutely essential for academic staff to enable them to best meet the needs of um, kind of increases in autism, for example, um, dyslexia, or the combination of the two, or other conditions on top of that. Um, so I, I absolutely agree that good CPD is absolutely the way to go and I think it's um, the needs are increasing at such a rate that, that it's essential but I, I do get the sense that the university sector are indeed investing in that within their um, system and are very aware particularly around mental health um, of the increases in that and the need to, to invest in, in their staff to make sure that they can provide the best teaching possible. Yeah we've got some very good examples of that uh, thank you so much Willie Coffey Convener, uh, good morning to you. Uh, I wonder if I could take you right back to the start and to the admissions process itself. Uh, and our students spend maybe five, six years at school getting their hires, advanced hires and so on, and then they apply to university and then they encounter this personal statement process that they have to get through. Um, is, there, is there any monitoring of that process to ensure that it complies with the principles of equality of access, not just for people with disabilities, but right across the population? Um, you mean of the personal statement yes. um, aspect of it? Um, there is there's no monitoring by SFC of, of how, admi admission, well, how that particular part of admissions um, is used. <coughs> Recently, as part of the, the work that the Commission for Widening Access was doing, and Fiona might want to come in later on this, we did look quite closely at how admissions was working, particularly um, because we were interested in, in knowing the extent to which institutions were using contextualised admissions and looking at the circumstances of a student so that they weren't just looking at the, you know, the number of hires they got, but were looking at the context in which the student got those hires. Now, the, that usually means in the context of, you know, are they from a school with a very low progression um, to university or are they from a you know, particular postcode and so on. But it can also be something, the context in which somebody got a particular set of hires can be affected um, by, by disability as well. What we found was that um, the personal statement was not always used by every institution. That often, you know, that they were, well, it was, it's, it's a part of the UCAS system and many institutions are using it. It's not a huge part of the selection criteria in most. Um, so, but if you're going to operate a contextualised admission system that looks at the, the whole student and understands the context in which they got the grades they got, then perhaps it needs to be done more. As part of the implementation of the Commission for Widening Access work, we will be working um, and the government will be working with um, institutions to make sure that contextualised admissions becomes more widespread and you know, the factors that are taken into account um, you know, are, are broader than the ones um, that are currently used. But I think that we don't currently monitor how um, admissions are done in, in institutions. Fiona, do you want to say any more on that? Um, just, just that it is a recommendation of the Commission on Widening Access that we take forward a, a full review of what they call non-academic factors. Um, I was part of the Secretariat for the Commission on Widening Access, so was aware um, of the work that went into that, and there was a, an expert group um, that was around admissions, so it was admissions staff, and just as John said, there was a uh, variance of, of how that particular element was used, and I'm also <clears throat> aware from a student perspective, how much time and effort can actually go into trying to provide a good personal statement. So it's important that it, of all that effort's been put in, that it's being considered um, equally across all our institutions. But on the other side, there was evidence that was given to suggest that um, quite often private schools, etc., know exactly the right information um, to put into a personal statement to give somebody an edge. So therefore, there was a bit of unfairness comparative to, to other kind of students. So it, it does need looked at to make sure that personal statements can be considered um, fairly, equally, and it provides um, additional information to help consideration in the admissions system. So we were looking forward to that work, and we fully agree with the recommendation that the Commission came up with. So some universities do use personal statements in the admissions process and some some don't but for those who do how, how on earth can we be sure that what they're doing 
and who they're admitting and who they're not admitting. How do we know that that's fair if there's no analysis of this? Yeah. The, the best kinds of contextualised admission systems will be based on evidence that shows that if you, if you take in a student who might have a, a couple of grades lower um, than you know, other students that you're taking in, but they're from a particular type of school or whatever, they, there is evidence that by the end of their university course, you know, they will perform as well as ones with a couple of grades higher from a different type of school. So what in, in the, the, perfect, the, the perfect world, they, there, there is evidence that that works in, in, and often the institutions have done it for their own entrance so that they can be quite clear they're being fair in taking you know, that student who's got lower grades than this student um, because they know the outcome will probably be the same because they have evidence that you know, in the past that when they've taken people with these grades from that type of school, they've, they've performed well. I, and you will have seen from the, um, the submissions you had in your, um, your, your, your own call for evidence, um, it's not at all widespread. And, and in fact, I'm not sure that any are doing, that universities are using um, the personal statements and, and issues about disability in making you know, contextualised admissions um, decisions. I think part of encouraging universities to do that would be building the evidence base that, of the kind that I've talked about, which tends to be about um, types of school rather than you know, the, the personal statements. I, I'd, I'd, it's more challenging to do that, but I think it, you know, it's worth exploring whether it can be done so that you can then make very robust contextualised admissions decisions which can take in, on board um, that kind of you know, con you know, background information. Sometimes, though, I think it will come down to you know, the training of the, the people making the admissions decisions and, you know, and how they use the information that's in the, um, the, the UCAS form to its full extent, and they're not just looking at the, you know, the, the higher grades. Uh, just my last point in this convener, for, so for two students, for example, who've got exactly the same passes, hires, advanced hires or whatever, applying to the same university from different towns in Scotland and one gets accepted and one doesn't, and the only basis in which they can conclude there's a difference is the personal statement, how on earth do those two students and their families know that one was treated fairly compared to the other if their passes are exactly the same. But where it's working well, um, a university will make it clear as part of the admissions process that it has a contextualised admissions system and the, th and the flags it will take on board um, that might make it... Because it, universities have hard decisions to make. That, you know, are, they can't admit everyone. And even you know, when they can admit people, you know, it's not often to the course they want. And so, on. so they do have hard decisions to make. But if you have a contextualised admission system that is based on evidence that if I take um, somebody with you know, four A's and the higher from that kind of school, somebody with two A's and two B's from you know, a school with very low progression or where there's other flags you can attach to the student, the evidence is that somebody who's done that well from that school is likely to thrive at university. When it's based on evidence, you can universities will publish that up front and make it clear that they do make contextualised offers based on that kind of evidence, so it's very open and transparent. Um, so in that case, you might get you know, two students who have exactly the same set of grades and one gets in and one doesn't because the other, you know, they're using contextualised admissions. Where it becomes more challenging is you know, if there isn't a contextualised admission system, how you, you monitor externally how the personal statement is used as opposed to something that's more evidence-based on the, you know, the postcode or type of school. Another thing that we're also doing is we've commissioned some research um, to look into contextualised admissions in much more detail because we're aware of excellent um, provisions at universities who do contextualised admissions, most do these days, who do contextualised admissions, um, but the, one of the issues is this is not necessarily entire transparency and consistency across all of them. Um, so one of the things we wanted to develop was a, a map of contextualised admissions right across Scotland and to advise us as to which were the best factors to use, the best factors to take into consideration so that we can um, then advise our um, university sector accordingly. So that work is under, being undertaken at the moment and should report early next year. Okay, thank you very much. Mary. Thank you. Um, 
<coughs> good, good morning to you. Um, I wanted to follow on and ask, ask a few questions about support packages that, that are available, because in, in the evidence that we've heard and the sessions we've had, there is an acknowledgement that, that um, equality for all and fairness and support should be freely given and, and everyone should be supported. Um, but the, th that's where it ends. If you have, for example, dyslexia, um, you are supported through university. If you have more complex needs, it's far more difficult to, to get the ongoing support, the, the package of care that you need. Um, and, and often people are, are put off by going through that, that, that whole process. Um, we've also heard that um, the application for additional funding for support can't be made until an offer from university has been made and accepted. So quite often the funding um, doesn't come with entrance to university. What can be done to ensure that universities do fully support individuals, do proper assessments and regularly assess to make sure that people are constantly getting the support that they need? The, um, I'll let Fiona come in with some of the detail later. On, on some, some of um, the support packages you've talked about there aren't ones funded by us, they're funded by SAS. And, but I think that issue about timing is, you know, and making sure there isn't a huge gap between um, you know, the, the acceptance and the kind of having the package in place is something that you know, is important and you know, I think should be looked at. Um, the, the more complex area is um, how you make sure that every student is supported because sometimes we are talking about relatively small numbers because you know it's people with you know complex conditions or combinations of conditions which might not appear in you know that department of that university every year um, and so having a, a responsive system that is partly about making sure that you know, the institutions are prepared and trained for, you know, for the, genera the generality of issues, if there is a, if it is a, a real generality, but also have a responsive system so that if, if you know some students are coming with particular needs, that you, you, you can put the training in place and sometimes adaptations as well quickly um, in, in order you know, to, to prepare for those students. And that is about having systems um, in the university that are geared up to do that so that it doesn't come as a surprise halfway through the year that you, you suddenly notice that, well, that, that, that's, that student needs a ramp or that student's blind. That it's, it's planned for and prepared for. Um, there are some very good examples of you know, courses being the, the, the deaf performance course, um, the conservatoire and so on, that are specifically designed. But in most cases, that isn't... You know, People will be choosing courses that aren't specifically um, going to be designed um, for students with disabilities. So it is going to have to be a responsive system in universities where they, they are using the resource that um, they get from the funding council in order to, to make sure that every student's need is, is met. And I, I think that needs to be responsive as well as preparatory on the kind of the, the wider range of needs. There, sometimes you will have to respond quite quickly to, gosh, we're going to have to do something about where that course is located or you know, what we're going to do to that building because we now do have students who have different needs. Fiona, do you want to say more on that? I suppose just to, to reflect that we are um, members of the, the new student support um, review group that's, that's looking into issues such as this and we've already fed in um, quite a lot of detail in relationship to uh, students with uh, disabilities, particularly the point that you made yourself about the time gap um, between them actually getting the support that they need and, and once they're actually in the university system. I think on the whole our, our system is about a it's kind of a rights-based model, if you like, that there is an assumption of, the, of need there, that um, there will be students with need, and it's the university's duty, and by law, obviously, to, to meet those needs. But there are, of course, the examples that you outline where that is particularly tricky and how that can um, better be done. I really look forward to, to working with the Student Support Review um, Group on that to, to see be Because that it seems, gap. almost from the evidence that we heard, that most um, educational institutions and, and universities are reactive in the support they give rather than being proactive. And it's about encouraging them to, to become more proactive about what they do. I, I, I think it needs to be a bit of both. And, I, and I, I th they need to be proactive and prepared and that they have systems that you know, assume that they can meet need and that you know, often that is something that's always there. But sometimes you will... Um, 
suddenly you know, have a couple of students with disabilities in the course that weren't there last year and you do have to react, but reacting quickly, being prepared, being proactively prepared to react, if that, if that doesn't sound like a contradiction, <laughs> but if you know what I mean, um, so that you, you're... You are looking at what, what the need is um, each year and, and are able to get things in place quickly is, is important. Can I just um, ask you, the, the, the submission that you've given us has been um, very helpful. Um, and, and in paragraph six, you say that underrepresentation <clears throat> is likely to be the result of a number of factors, such as low attainment at schools for pupils with additional support needs. And when I first read that, it, 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 it seems a bit of a sweeping statement. If you have additional support needs, you will have lower attainment. What other reasons are there, or have you done any, any work to find out what other reasons there are for the lower attainment levels? And is it just about the support packages that are put in place for young people when they're at school? No, I mean, I, I think there will, there will be un other reasons. Um, Interestingly, we, we fund both colleges and universities, and the figures are different in the two sectors. So I think you know, some of the... It, it's just about displacement. In, in that, a lot of um, people with disabilities, the numbers are higher in colleges. So because of that, they, they're obviously going to college instead of university to some extent. Um, it, that, that is a sweeping statement. I accept that. And you know, it's one that we probably do need to dig into more deeply uh, because... But some of that is about the data um, that um, we don't, as far as I'm aware, have very good data on, you know, on individual types of disability at school and how that relates to flow through um, to university and college. I think it's an area we do need to look more closely at the data and accept that was a, a bit of a sweeping statement. What the actual reference to it um, relates to students in the school system, according to the Scottish Government statistics, uh, where the student has um, a... Uh, an individual educational learning plan or a coordinated support plan of, of some nature. And when you look at the attainment um, of those students comparative to their peers, it is quite significantly lower, but it doesn't actually break it down by um, type of disability. But I am aware that the, those, those figures um, are available in the Scottish Government, and we've been working with them, particularly in the college system, to see if there's a way that we can link the two sets of data up better so colleges can um, kind of future-proof themselves, if you like, for the, the students that are coming through the school system um, at the moment. And there's absolutely no reason that that same kind of process couldn't happen with the mm. university system as well. So just to make the data uh, more available to kind of both sectors about specifically who the pupils are in the school system at the moment that are coming through and what they may or may not need from the college and university mm. system if they choose to stay in Scotland, of course. Yeah, and, and obviously, I mean, a young person that's, that's in the, the school system that, that has additional support needs and has a package in place um, of, of support that they need to, to get them through the school... I'm not sure if, if, if it happens, and if it doesn't, I'm not quite sure why it doesn't. Um, I, I understand there are concerns about the sharing of, of, of data, but it would seem that if the, the support plan that's in school is used almost as a basis um, for the support that they need when they go on to, to, to higher education, and then that support package could be built on, would that not streamline the process slightly? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. One of the, the key issues that happens um, is that um, obviously when you leave school you are an adult, an adult. Yeah. Um, so you have the right not to, to mm -hmm. declare and that actually is quite common that students will choose not to declare well, presuming obviously it's not a, a visible disability but they will uh, choose not, not to declare and sometimes it only becomes apparent um, when they start to really need the support um, so when it, particularly when it comes to exam time for exa example and the pressures come up and then and there's a recognition that actually I, I, need, I need help at, at this point and that's always a difficulty and um, universities kind of do a lot of work to try and encourage as much um, declaration as they possibly can so that they don't have that last minute problem and issue um, because obviously they'll do everything that they can to help but if it's been left too late it's very difficult for them to, over, okay. to overcome that so, so we do uh, work with the universities on that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Jeremy. Uh, good morning and thank you very much uh, for coming. <coughs> just a couple of areas I'd just like to explore a wee bit further. Uh, we obviously have the outcome agreements and you talked, John, in your initial comment about how you're trying to maybe make them a bit more proactive and encourage universities. Um, I suppose the, the question I have is what happens if a university, it may pay lip service to it, but in practice nothing is changing. What, what sanctions would you think of 
and have you ever considered that in the last four years? Yeah. The <coughs> it's, a, it's a very sensitive issue with universities, that one. We, where we have put in place specific funding, um, for, for, for example, for things like widening access, um, and universities have not been filling these places with widening access students. We have taken the places away and moved them elsewhere. So our main sanction it would be about how we um, how we use our funding. Um, and you know, it's not an area that we've gone into yet on any other or any protected characteristic. We've only used that sanction um, with additional places for widening access. But our, in our outcome agreement guidance, we do um, refer to the, the kind of things we might do um, you know, where um, an outcome agreement not to be met. And the, the ultimate sanction is not funding bits of activity. However, um, that was something that we would we would only do in extremists, because what we would want to do is use the system to get the institution to respond and um, you know, to meet needs. Now, in the case of um, you know, protected characteristics and disability, then the, inst the institution has, you know, has a, a legal obligation to do things as well. So I mean, our, our funding um, is, is part of the, you know, the, the suite of things that will encourage them to do it, but it's not the only one. And if we were to, um, and this is, this is a, a real dilemma for us sometimes, if, if, if we were to say, right, Institution X isn't very good at meeting the needs of disabled students, we are withdrawing X amount of funding and moving it to Institution Y that is far better. Now, in the long run, that doesn't help the, the students who might want to go to that first institution, they need to do the courses that, that the first institution does. So, I mean, our, our, our prime aim is to encourage that institution to, to improve rather than to use a primarily sanctions-based approach. But, but that sanction does exist and has been used where additional places have not been met. But on, on, on something like equalities then, I mean, if, if an institution um, were that bad, it, it wouldn't be meeting its legal duties either. So, I mean, that would put it in a very bad place. So, we, we need to be encouraging institutions um, to improve, to better meet needs. And, you know, I think we all acknowledge that, you know, while there are some very good examples of what, of what institutions are doing, there, are, there is room for improvement as well. And we want to encourage that improvement rather than use a sanction-based approach. Do you want to say more on that, Fiona? Yeah, this was sort of my experience as an outcome agreement manager. Um, the outcome agreement isn't essentially just the document itself. It's the whole process that sits um, around that. So there's an element as an outcome agreement manager of, of support to your institutions, but there's also a huge um, element of challenge co consistently throughout that academic year. So if they've committed to um, achieve a certain target that's been accepted by um, the funding council, your job as an outcome agreement manager is to continually ask for progress updates on where are you with that um, and if you're not achieving it, well, well why not and what are you doing about that because you're invested in it too. So you want by the end of that um, time period for the data to come in and show, yep, no, they said they were going to do that, they've done that and, it, it's, and it's, 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 it's worked and it's, it's achieved. So it's, there's kind of so much more to it than, than just getting the actual document kind of agreed and there is an awful lot of um, challenge on outcome agreement managers to really deliver within the funding council as well. Okay, um, thank you. I, I suppose, um, just going back to the widening access issue, which I think clearly all of us um, are, are signed up to and want to see happen. I, I suppose one of the unforeseen circumstances with a capped number of students is what happens to the person who goes to the school that gets for four A's, but doesn't get the place. Uh, and how do we end up not having discrimination the other way that because I go to a certain school, I don't get a place because I seem to be getting an advantage academically? Have you done any work around how we level that off? Or oh, we're not at that stage yet. Are we so far behind the curve that that's not really an issue? The, I, think, I think the issue about... Uh, in, in, well, uh, there's one... 
admissions should be about fairness. Uh, we should be, uh, if, if there is any limitation, and, and actually even, even if the, every, everyone who applied to university could get in, there would still be issues that some courses are more popular than others. So there does need to be a system of ensuring that the, the fair system of ensuring that the, you know, the right students get onto the right course. And that has to be about, I think, ensuring that the students with the, the best potential get onto these courses. And that, as I've talked about earlier, is about more than just exam results. It, it contextualised admissions is part of having a fair system. If the number of place, if, if we are to increase the number of applications from um, you know, the groups that are currently not going to university, that will, um, unless you know, something changes with the groups who are currently going, lead to a higher demand. And you know, the UCAS figures out um, yesterday, I think, that, um, that indicated that you know, not everyone is getting in, and the, the proportion that are not getting um, in you know, has been going up. And there are a number of solutions to that. Um, however, I, I think the, the solution um, that we should be exploring most closely, and I think is you know, a solution that gives you a, a better outcome for most students, is looking at how we use the capacity in schools, colleges and universities together to improve the learner journey so that there are you know, routes into higher education through college into university and that we use those to the maximum extent and use the capacity of, of both sectors so that increasingly, you know, everyone who wants to get into higher education can. Um, but while that um, is, is working, we need fair admissions so that even within that system, you know, people getting onto the right course are getting it for fair reasons. I mean, I, and I suppose I declare interest, but I did happen to go to an independent school. I mean, I was interested with Fiona's comment that the private schools seem to have this kind of slight edge in regard to how they maybe fill out the form. Well, presumably it's not rocket science. Someone's told them how to do it. So why are we not telling every school how to fill out? And presumably it's not kind of, you go off into a secret room if you're a private school and told something that nobody else is told in the state sector. So why is that information not being shared? I mean, I felt it, it does seem slightly unfair. I mean, that may not be your area, but are you encouraging people to work out how you should fill out the form to the best way? Yeah. So, so well, I'll go first. Then. Some of the, um, the, the work that we um, support um, with schools projects is about both encouraging more people to apply to university from schools that um, you know, traditionally haven't, but also supporting those schools in, in exactly that kind of thing. Um, but then it, 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 it's a thought experiment. You know, if everyone was writing the perfect um, personal statement, and everyone had four A's in their hires, you still need to make choices. So th th they need to be done in a fair, evidence-based, robust way so that we are getting the right people into the right courses and universities. Okay, and let me, I was just going to kind of highlight that we do, we do have um, <laughs> access initiatives, the School to Higher Education programme, for example, that, that works with low progression schools. We've got access to the high demand professions as well, which is medicine, law, creative, um, that, that works with, with pupils who um, are interested in that to help them get the best application process that, that they can. And it's also the reason why we're investing in this piece of work, uh, the research that I referred to earlier, because the contextualised admissions process is so, so important to making sure that they... Um, um, the admission process enables us to have um, the best talent in the university sector, but the talent that best reflects the population of Scotland as well, so it's kind of diverse and it reflects the full, the full nature um, of that. So hopefully those three things together, and I, th I think that the, the work that the Commission on Widening Access have asked us to do in relationship to the non-academic factors, so the personal statement, is absolutely crucial, because we need to get, if we are going to use that, we need to make sure it's used fairly um, and by all universities in, in the same way, and that everybody knows when they fill that in um, that it's going to be considered kind of equally right across the, the range. And it's a very difficult thing for universities as well, because the personal statements are used in so many different ways and it's quite subjective in its very nature. Uh, I mean, just very briefly, my final, final question, I, I noticed on the BBC website coming into work this morning that Bristol University um, have taken a view that they're now going to have different academic results depending on what school you come from. Is, is that a model that, are there universities that we can point to here in Scotland that have that policy as well or is that something that you're looking to move forward on? 
Yes, um, yeah, I mean, the, Bristol University has been doing that for some years, and they, they were the pioneers in contextualised admissions. And, and yes, increasingly, um, universities in Scotland are using it. Um, in fact, I, I would say the majority of universities use some form of contextualised admissions, which which it looks at comparing what um, you know a, a particular set of hires might look like from different. Schools now. Sometimes it's, they use low progression schools. Um, sometimes they use other flags that would you know, identify a student that might have different circumstances. But that system exists. I would say in the majority of Scottish universities. And we're looking forward to the announcement of the uh, Commissioner for Fair Access as well, who will um, presumably help us take forward the recommendation in the Commission on Widening Access report about the access thresholds as well, and kind of the next evolution of, of contextualised admissions, if you like. Thank you. Anyone else? Um, last week was last week and the previous week we were speaking about admissions again, um, and we had a, a witness in who was BSL who went through university. Now, he had said it was very difficult for him to do his personal statement in written English because that's not how he's used to speaking. Um, and we also there's other people who maybe written English isn't their first choice. And we were asking, is there other ways of admission? So could a BSL admission be accepted as um, an application? Could video or something like that be used as application? Because people maybe feel more confident in putting their personal statement forward like that. Um, and it's just something that most of the universities last week hadn't considered it. And and I, I, I've, I've read the evidence of your, of your, of your earlier hearings, and it's one that, and that particular one, I was, I, I was thinking about. You know, could that be done now? You, UCAS run the admission system rather than us, but I mean, clearly we have an interest in making sure that that is, is fair and that it's um, effective. I think it's, it's something we should explore whether there are um, changes that can be made that that would would allow that. Um, the I, I, I would think it would be challenging to do. I mean, the, the UCAS system is a, a fairly big streamlined system which it, it takes um, a huge number of applications and dishes them out to lots and lots of different universities. And um, it, So I, I think there might be technical challenges within that, but I think it's worth exploring you know, whether they can be overcome. And there are, of course, quite a few institutions that um, you know, don't recruit through the traditional UCAS system. They, you know, there are variations for the conservatoire and the art schools and so on because they, they, they use portfolios and auditions. So, I th so it's possible to do some of these things. So I think we'd be happy to explore whether that, that would, mm -hmm. would be feasible. But I mean, I, I, I'm not sure I could give a, yeah, a no, absolutely. categorical mm -hmm. answer at the moment. And then obviously the other sort of a side of it is if we can look at doing something like that, how do we then look at assessments and exams? So if someone's BSL, can, do we look at that side of it as well? Yeah, well, when they, well that's immediately the, the, the question that would arise. If somebody's admitted based on something that doesn't include written English, but the course you know, requires written English, then we need to take decisions about, well, is it reasonable to then change the course? or, or And I, I think these are valid questions that do need to be looked at. So um, I think we, we'd be happy to, um, with UCAS, explore that mm -hmm. um, and you know, see whether it, it, it's feasible. We're also members of the National Advisory Group as well um, for the development of the, the plan that will be coming out, the National Plan, um, and are kind of feeding in kind of yeah. that information yeah. in, into that. Brilliant, thank you. Thanks. Alex. Thank you, convener. Good morning, and thank you for coming to see us today. I'd like to look at the issue of admissions through a slightly different lens, and that's about when uh, children, uh, pupils and students with additional support needs or disabilities, um, how they choose to come to which university, and the barriers to that decision-making based on the fact that we've heard a myriad of evidence over the last couple of weeks um, from people who talk about things like the wider student experience not being... Um, particularly geared up to deal with their additional needs in terms of the society life and the wider social elements to university, but also the physical access to buildings. And we've, um, uh, having gone to an ancient university myself, I remember tutorials, four, fl four flights of steps up in a windy garret um, that absolutely would have been inaccessible to people with mobility needs. Now, 
some of this requires just an astronomical, almost prohibitive amount of expenditure. So as a funding council in particular, um, what are you doing to help universities box clever um, and disseminate best practice as to how we get round these significant obstacles, both to the wider student experience and to the physicality of access to the university estate? Um, first of all, I mean, I, I've, I've read some of the evidence of the, the previous sessions, and, and I was struck by the, the point that was made by, by several students that even when um, access was arranged to the academic part of the course that the, some of the, um, the wider student experience was less accessible um, as well. And that, that, that it's something that we do need to consider how, um, you know, it's, it isn't just about that tutorial room, it's about this, the student union and, and, and all the other things that go around it. I, in the evidence that I read, I, I think there is evidence that some of the, the universities are boxing clever. And they, if, if their whole estate isn't accessible and can't be made accessible straight away, then they're, they're making sure that things are located in you know, the parts of the estate that are. Um, but I, it was evident from what I read that um, you know, often that wasn't happening as neatly as it could. People were, it was only after people had climbed up the four flights of stairs that um, you know, they realised there was an issue and then um, changes were made and it wasn't always happening. So um, part of, in the ideal world, what we could do is, is fund universities with enough capital um, that they could resolve all of the, the, the really difficult issues. I mean, realistically, um, you know, in the current financial climate, you know, it is going to take some time um, you know, for that to happen. Um, but nonetheless, students are going to university now and you know, knowing that in 10 years' time somebody will have an accessible building is of no use to the current students. So we do need to encourage um, universities to, as you say, box clever. And I, I, within the evidence, um, I thought there were some very good stories about how that was being handled and there were some stories where that wasn't happening and I think part of the task of the funding council um, and other bodies is to you know, disseminate that good practice and make sure that that is the standard and that the bits of bad practice aren't happening um, but the bit that I think is more challenging and I think is important is is universities will um, react to you know, the tutorial rooms or the labs being accessible and you know, make to some adjustments for that, but but some of the stories that I read about, you know, the, the you know, what ha what's happening in the refectory and things like that, that's important too, and we need to encourage best practice in that too. But I, I, our role is, I think, using the outcome agreement system and our other interactions with institutions to promote best practice, and working with some of the other organisations that you've heard from as part of this <coughs> investigation. I'm glad that you mentioned outcome agreements there at the end there because that brings me neatly into my second question because I'm very interested in the application of outcome agreements in the university sector. Um, I think it's a, a fair criticism levelled at the at local authority single outcome agreements and in a lot of cases since they were first envisaged in, nine, in 2007 um, that they, they sat on a shelf in a local authority mm. and gathered dust until the next iteration mm. of the single outcome agreement was to be published. Yeah. Um, there was no sanction deployed against local authorities that didn't meet their own outcomes um, and very little scrutiny. Uh, very little consistency as well. So I'm really interested to hear how you get universities to take those single, those outcome agreements seriously, how you measure them, how you measure success, and more importantly, how you measure failure against the delivery of them. I mean, our, our outcome agreements certainly don't sit on a shelf. Um, we have, have a system where, uh, while outcome agreements have a three year, usually have a three year time horizon, they are refreshed annually. So there's an annual cycle um, where we issue guidance, making it clear what we, we think the outcome agreements um, should contain. Um, and then you know, there's a process of agreeing the outcome agreement between SFC and the, the institution. But once that's done, um, we, we then have a process where we ask the institution um, to do a, a self-evaluation um, of how it's done against the previous year's outcome agreement, including all the targets, and to reflect on um, whether it's done well or badly or it could have done better. Uh, and we um, then 
yeah, assess that self-evaluation, also using a whole range of data that we, we collect through the Higher Education Statistics Authority and other things, so that as well as their self-evaluation, we're looking at their performance on widening access and a whole number of other things, um, and engaging with them um, throughout the year, but particularly at the time of the self-evaluation. And we use that self-evaluation um, to feed into um, our consideration of the next year's outcome agreement. So, um, and actually, round about this time of year, our council will meet tomorrow and will consider the evidence from the self-evaluations and the current performance as a kind of prior decision-making process before it decides what to do about next year's outcome agreement. So there's an annual cycle of um, preparing the outcome agreement, having the guidance for the next year's assessing performance, but also, as Fiona said earlier, um, the outcome agreement is partly about the written piece of paper and the assessment of how well they're doing against And that is, you know, in its essence, a funding contract with the institution. But it's also about um, the relationship between the outcome manager, um, of, of whom Fiona is one, and the, the institution, so that there is somebody who is constantly challenging the institution and, and, and supporting them sometimes. You know, if they're saying, well, we're having trouble doing X, are there ways you can help? But also a support and challenge function which goes on throughout the year. Um, and you know, there are particular points where that feeds into the outcome agreement preparation, but there are other points where it's just ongoing challenge. So they certainly don't sit on a shelf. There is a, a, you know, a, an annual process and cycle round about them, which we pursue fairly vigorously. Yeah. Thank you. Just to add to that, there's also um, the access team within the funding council as well. So a key element of our job is to assess every one of the outcome agreements <clears throat> and in terms through a widening access lens and provide feedback to the individual outcome agreements and that is shared with um, at director level and also at chief executive level so that's all documented um, in terms of how the quality of each individual one and how they compare um, to each other and that again feeds into the guidance for, for future years and to the individual institution where that is necessary. Maybe? Um, just to, to follow on from um, the line of questioning that, that um, Alex started, um, in 2004, the University of Edinburgh conducted a study on disabled students in higher education. And there was a number of, of, of points highlighted. And in the evidence that we've heard in the last few weeks, many of the points that were highlighted in 2004 um, that caused problems for students with disabilities have been raised to us again. And I appreciate that there are a number of outcome agreements and, and that you, you monitor um, and, and work with um, in institutions, but it would seem that very little progress has been made in a, in a number of areas. And while I welcome the appointment of a commissioner for, for widening access, there, there must be another mechanism for ensuring that, that, that more is done to, to widen access. And I'd be interested in your, your thoughts yeah. on that. Uh, well, because one of the things that, that is key to this is a disabled um, student's premium and the, the criteria for how that's set, you know, the strategic funding programme this is used for and, and how and universities are either encouraged to use that or to use it better um, and how that, that's monitored because that, that, that ties into Mary's question and into what, what we're doing but actually there's funding streams here to make sure it gets done and, uh -huh. and, and how is it getting done? Yeah, um, I, I, would, I would accept your point that um, a lot of the issues that have come up in, in, in this investigation are ones that have been about for some time. I would contend that there has been some progress. If you look at the, um, particularly the, the retention rates for students, generally they have been they're improving over the years and that the gap between you know, students who are declaring a disability and, and all students has been narrowing. So I think, I think there has been progress. And I think in, in that time there have been you know, some very you know, good examples like you know, the, the Conservatoire's deaf performance course of you know, institutions doing um, very good things. I, I would accept, though, that there is still a journey to go um, and that part of, of narrowing, you know, further narrowing the gap and um, you know, attainment between students with a disability and others is about how you correctly apply the funding that universities have to support all students. Part of the, the reason we, um, several years ago, 
put the disabled students premium in effect into the main pot of funding because it exists as a separate line but it used to be that an institution would get it based on the number of students with declared disabilities that it had um, but we felt that that in it, it, that was probably over um, supporting some institutions and under supporting some others and that I mean it, because dyslexia is such a big um, part of the you know, declared disabilities in universities. It was skewing it towards particular institutions. And our view was that all institutions have a responsibility to, you know, to be prepared for um, you know, students with a disability and that that should be in proportion to the number of students they have, not just the ones with, with bigger numbers. So we you know, quite deliberately put it in, you know, in proportion to the main pot. Um, and while we hold institutions accountable um, for what they're doing um, on disability um, through the outcome agreements. We don't, we, we expect them to use all of the funding that we give them for students as part of that, um, in theory. I mean, clearly not all of it. <laughs> it's, you know, it goes for all students, but, but in, 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 in looking at what pot of money they have to support disabled students, they should be looking at the whole pot, not just you know, the, the proportion that is identified as a disabled student's premium, because it's a legal responsibility that they, they serve um, all protected characteristics. So um, our, our, our philosophy has been that the, um, while funding is important, we don't want this to be an area where we're, we're trying to work out um, in exactly what the cost of each particular student is and then give that, because that leads to the kind of, you know, the lumpiness of reaction that, um, you know, means that institutions aren't responding quickly enough. We expect institutions to see this as core business and build it into their core funding. As I've said earlier, it's, it, I think it might be an area where we do need to up our focus a bit more so that we are clearer about expectations and, and about making sure that the good practice is happening more in a more widespread way. But I think there has been some progress. I mean, the, the fact that the, the retention rates have been narrowing the gap between all students and students with disabilities is positive. It, it's not fast enough. Some of these things you know, do take a while to fix and we should be pushing for it to be faster. Thank you. Just bumping up against our, our time when we have a, another panel this morning, but just very, very quickly on, on the back of that, John, that um, the, the Scottish Funding Council reports on destinations of university graduates. No, you don't. We want to know whether you do, actually. We know that colleges report destinations, and one of the measures um, in maybe measuring where students have been successful uh, in their, their, their higher education uh, is to determine their destinations. We know colleges uh, report on that, but whether universities do and whether that would be something that you would consider building in to the outcome agreement. We do. Um, th there is a report on destinations of leavers from um, universities. Um, do you have the figures in, in front of you, Fiona? Yes, yes, Adrian. I do. Um... Um, and, and, uh, do you know, I'll, I'll ask Fiona to come in later and explain what they are. Um, what, what, Port with us, that would yeah, be helpful. Yeah. Um, and what I would stress, though, is these destinations are six months after graduation, and quite a lot of students, I mean, I mean all students, not just those from protected characteristics, um, will, will not have settled in their final career by then. So there's a bit of a health warning about these statistics. But we, we do... Um, but they are collected by the Higher Education Statistics Authority. Specific uh, elements of, of young people or people who have left university who have disabilities, though, yeah. yes, absolutely. is it broken yes. down yes. in yes. that yeah. way? Yeah. That, yes. that would be helpful. I, I, I can share that with us. Yeah. A very similar story to that that's in the um, College Leaver Destination Survey as well. So, so there is yeah. um, a gap, which yeah. is obviously yeah. not what we yeah. want. That, we want we, that we can share that data with you. Yeah. That would be really helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, can can I, I thank you both for, mm -hmm. for your attendance at committee this morning and your written evidence and, and future evidence that, right. that you've agreed to, to share with us. We, we appreciate um, mm -hmm. your, your responses this morning. Um, and I think we've got uh, some way forward uh, with mm -hmm. some of the, the inquiries that we're doing. So thank you so much. And right. if you go away and you think you should have told us something else, please get back in touch okay. with us. Okay. Thank, thank you. you very I'm going time. to suspend committee for about five minutes for a very quick comfort break, and then we're back in with the Minister and the Cabinet Secretary.
Good morning and welcome back to uh, the Equality and Human Rights Committee. Um, our second panel for this morning on our um, inquiry on the budget. Um, we have with us this morning Angela Constance, who is the Cabinet Secretary for Communities, Social Security and Equalities. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, Shirley Ann Somerville, who is the Minister for Further Education, Higher Education and Science. Good morning, Minister, and I believe this is your first appearance at a committee. As a minister, yes, yeah. it is. Yep. Excellent. We'll be gentle with you. Um, and supporting both of those this morning, we have Leslie Irvin, Head of Equality Policy, and Leah Fitzgerald, who is a Policy Manager, Higher Education Division with Scottish Government. Good welcome. Uh, good welcome. Good morning to you all, uh, to, to committee. We have, we, are, we now, this is essentially our final um, session on, on our inquiry on the budget. And we decided to focus on a part of the budget on equalities about widening access and specifically about people with disabilities and who use BSL as a language and accessing university. So that's why we needed both of you here today in order to address some of the equalities issues and to address some of the widening access and the, the, the policy functional issues at university as well. So we're really delighted and uh, I know your busy schedules mean this is not always possible, but we're really delighted to have you here this morning. You'll have maybe have heard some of the evidence that we've already had, but I believe maybe both of you have an opening statement you want to kick off with. Cabinet Secretary, would you like to go first? Okay, thank you, Convener, and uh, good morning, Committee. Uh, grateful for the opportunity to appear before Committee uh, as part of your scrutiny process of the 2017-18 <coughs> uh, draft budget. Um, you will appreciate, as the draft budget will not be published until this afternoon, uh, the committee will be aware that I'm not able to comment or reflect uh, on the government's spending plans. I can, however, uh, confirm to committee that, as in previous years, uh, equality analysis and assessment has been undertaken as part of the, the budget preparatory work. Uh, the results of that work will be published in the eighth equality budget statement that will accompany uh, the draft budget. And also, as in previous years, we've been supported in this process by the Equality Budget Advisory Group, so I want to put on record uh, my thanks to its members for their expertise, for their insight, and of course for the challenge uh, that they bring as we continue to look uh, for the best ways to ensure proper uh, consideration of equality right across the government. I of course understand that the committee is very keen to focus on disability and access to universities. Uh, my colleague, Ms Somerville, is best placed to engage with the committee on access to university and matters relating to disability and uh, education. But I would like to say just a few words uh, about disability equality uh, more uh, broadly. And actually, I think it's a, it's a great idea to have uh, ministers from different portfolios actually appear uh, before committee because it's important that as a government that we're demonstrating that joined up approach and that equality is for every portfolio uh, and not just uh, the, the, the communities and equalities portfolio. It is uh, 20 years since the Disability Discrimination Act was introduced. That's now been replaced by the Equality Act. Yet, whilst progress has been made, uh, we know there are still many uh, disabled people who are unable to live their lives as they want. Uh, the barriers they face day in, day out, uh, prevent them from making uh, their full contribution to, to daily and to public life. So the way our public services, our workplaces, local environments are designed to operate can exclude people, uh, and this is just quite simply uh, not acceptable. The committee uh, will be more than aware that on the 2nd of December we published the Fairer Scotland for Disabled People Delivery Plan to 2021. The plan draws on the, the views of disabled people and those who participated uh, in the consultations and discussions. And the plan has five long-term ambitions and a wide range of actions that we will take over the lifetime of this parliament. And we are determined to make meaningful progress uh, for example, in reforming adult social care so that we shift the focus to achieving independent living, uh, promoting independent advocacy so that people know about and can claim uh, their rights in mental health, for example, and conducting an awareness raising campaign to tackle uh, negative attitudes as part of the One Scotland campaign next year. In the coming period, uh, we will be very focused on addressing the employment gap for disabled people and our new devolved Scottish Employability Programme will give high quality support uh, tailored uh, to the needs of disabled people. And we will be placing dignity and respect at the very heart of our new social security system 
and our ambition that Scotland should be the best place in the world uh, for our children and our young people to grow up it has to apply to all of our children. And we will be developing a national framework for disabled children and young people to ensure that they get the best provision and support possible. Our Fairer Scotland Action Plan will also work to ensure a fairer, more equal society for all of Scotland's people. At the heart of that plan is 50 fairness actions for this parliamentary term uh, that will help us meet those ambitions. And again, this ranges uh, right across all areas of government responsibility. And, you know, my final word is that we all know, convener, that creating a, a fairer Scotland actually requires all of us. Uh, it requires government, it requires communities, it requires listening to people with that lived experience uh, of poverty and disability. It will require business and industry, uh, public and third sector, to work together to achieve change. Uh, we know that government uh, cannot deliver change on its own, and nor would we want to. So we will continue to work with anyone and everyone uh, to make these actions uh, a reality. Uh, and one final uh, note, convener, I just want to highlight to committee that we have maintained uh, our commitment to equality investment over this period of public spending constraint. Uh, and we will continue to support and work with a range of organisations that represent disabled people. It is important it is vital that the voices of disabled people are heard and that disabled people participate in shaping the decisions uh, that affect them. So I very much welcome uh, this uh, important inquiry and would be very happy to consider incorporating recommendations coming from the committee into the disability delivery plan, uh, which will be monitored uh, to ensure progress and to take account uh, of emerging issues. Uh, because at the end of the day, convener, we, share, we all share the same aim that disabled people should be able to uh, study at universities without experiencing uh, discrimination and barriers, which could and indeed uh, should be removed. Uh, and I very much look forward to a discussion this morning. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary Minister. <coughs> Thank you, Convener, and good morning. Can I reiterate the point that the Cabinet Secretary um, has made that due to the timings of today's uh, statement, I will also be unable to answer questions around the detail of the budget that will be given later today. But the Committee is aware that widening access for higher education is a key priority for this Government, and indeed the 2014-15 programme for Government set out a stretching ambition that a child born today, irrespective of socio-economic circumstances, should have an equal chance of entering university. It's a policy objective very much in harmony with our wider vision for a fairer, more equal Scotland that is driven by inclusive economic growth. The Commission on Widening Access was established to advise us of the steps necessary to meet that ambition, and the Commission made 34 recommendations which, taken together, represent a bold and ambitious agenda for change. Indeed, I would argue that it is perhaps the most radical set of actions being undertaken anywhere in the UK to tackle what has often been regarded as an intractable problem in our education systems across the world. The committee has already heard evidence that the Commission's primary focus was on tackling socio-economic inequality. However, I would echo Russell Gunson's evidence that there are intersections between these issues and disabled access. I was struck, for example, by the common themes emerging in the evidence heard so far by the committee, issues such as cultural barriers and the need for enhanced pastoral care. I would therefore expect the Commission's proposals to have a naturally positive impact on the participation of disabled learners, perhaps especially those relating to the reform of admissions, more rigorous support for access learners and progression from college. The Commission also recommended that the new Commissioner for Fair Access should consider whether there are further barriers for learners with protected characteristics and to make any necessary recommendations to Ministers. Similarly, in October, I announced an independent review of FE and HE student support, and the aim of that review is to assess the effectiveness of the system for student support for all students engaged in further and higher education in Scotland and make recommendations for change. The review will consist of a number of subgroups, and one of which is around support available to vulnerable students, and understanding the needs of students with disabilities will be an integral and core part of that work. So there are a number of mechanisms through which we can ensure the evidence specific to this cohort is examined thoroughly and that any necessary policy interventions are tailored to meet specific needs. And in this regard, the work being completed by this committee will form a crucial part of the ongoing discussions. Uh, 
It is important also to have in mind that institutions have clear statutory duties in relation to disabled learners, and I am sure the committee shares my expectation that they be very proactive in responding to the evidence that emerges from this work too. I will close by highlighting that while by no means perfect access for disabled learners is improving, the proportion of undergraduate entrants with a declared disability has increased year on year and as of 2014-15 stands at 10.8% of total entrants. Retention is also improving and it is a significant to note that the gap with all learners has closed to just over one percentage point. The, dis the disabled student allowance in Scotland has been protected and continues to be demand-led, meaning that the budget is determined purely by student need. This is all positive and indicates that our policy direction, together with the more practical interventions of the Funding Council and institutions, are delivering outcomes. But we are very much not complacent. As with all areas of access, we are ambitious and sharply focused on securing a more equitable distribution of opportunities for all, and I look forward to working with the committee to achieve that. Thank you very, very, very much, Minister. Um, Cabinet Secretary, in your opening statement, you mentioned the disability de delivery plan and the work that, that's being done on that, and specifically on the, the work of this committee. Um, we, we're very interested in that. But you, you'll realise, just as well as I do, that, and I think the figures are around about 50% of households who are in poverty have someone in that household with a disability. Um, I think that's a, that, that's a figure, and that's a huge proportion. So in order to have that inclusive economy that we want, we have to create the opportunities for people in order to lift themselves out of poverty. And one of those opportunities is a university education, because it then leads to a higher paid job and, and, and more opportunities in that respect. How, how do you see that playing out in the disability delivery plan? And I can see quite clearly how the two portfolios can work very, very closely together on this, with the policy being right and the delivery being right. You could make huge changes, life-changing opportunities uh, for, for people here. But I just wonder whether there's a specific areas of the disability delivery plan where you could address that specific <coughs> issue and, and whether you can give us some insight into that this morning. Yeah, absolutely, convener. And it's important to note that the longer young people spend in either education uh, or training, so some of what I'm about to say, you know, applies uh, to FE, HE, you know, modern apprenticeship programmes, in that all the evidence shows that for, for any young person, the longer they spend in education or training, the better their career prospects are, and therefore the better uh, that, 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 that their income is. There are um, many actions uh, in the Disability Delivery Plan, and actually also the Fairer Scotland Action Plan, because the Fairer Scotland Action Plan um, has a huge focus uh, on income, inequality and some very specific measures uh, in and around tackling uh, inequality, <coughs> socio-economic uh, disadvantage in particular. I suppose the one action that I would draw committee's um, attention to is uh, Action 20 in the Disability uh, Delivery Plan, where it talks about that all-encompassing approach that we need to work with schools, uh, local authorities, um, health and social care partnerships, further and higher education institutions, and in particular, to focus on transitions. So transitions for young people with disabilities, you know, starting school, going from primary to secondary school, uh, going from secondary school to their post-school uh, destinations, and then, crucially, going from university or college uh, into work uh, because we know that even where young people um, are uh, making significant educational achievements that isn't always being translated uh, into to the workplace so that focus on transitions is crucially important and that requires um, I think a change of mindset continuing to evolve our ways of working. Um, it's easy to talk about partnership working, but partnership working in terms of tackling transitions um, is, is, is absolutely crucial. So while there's you know, many actions in the disability delivery plan that are you know, you know, indirectly or directly relevant to supporting young people to pursue you know, their dreams of uh, participating in higher education, uh, there are you know, particular actions, and I think Action 20 and that focus on transitions uh, is, is, is crucially important. Yeah, I, I wholeheartedly agree, agree with you there. Alex. Thank you, Convener. And good morning, Minister. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you for your time this morning. Um, Cabinet Secretary, I complimented this government in 
debate in Parliament last week about its intent to bring forward a framework for children and families affected by disability and at absolutely high time. Um, I'm interested very much in the content of that and what that's going to look like and the resource behind it. Uh, nearly 10 years ago, England and Wales got a, its own strategy for disabled children, aiming high for disabled children. And with that um, came a consequential of £36 million. But because of the presumption against ring fencing, that went straight into local authority um, grants and didn't go to children with disabilities. I think we still have a way to make up on that regard. Um, can you, uh, without obviously wanting to preempt the stuff you can't talk about in terms of the budget or financial settlements around that. Can you reassure us that this will be adequately resourced? Yeah, I mean, I firmly believe that the disability delivery plan will be uh, adequately resourced. Um, I certainly have read Mr Cole Hamilton's speech that he made uh, in the debate led by uh, my colleague Jean Freeman last week because it had been highly commended uh, to me along with Mr Balfour's speech. So I went back to the official record and read uh, both um, speeches. And I was particularly struck that, you know, Mr Cole Hamilton spoke about that life stage, that lifespan uh, approach, which is absolutely important. So while I will point to the fact, as I said in my opening remarks, that we've protected the uh, equality budget, I can also point to the fact that over this period of uh, tough times, we've also protected uh, the third sector budget. And I actually believe that the, the uh, Empowering Communities Fund has an important role to play here as well um, in terms of participation uh, and in terms of changing that mindset um, about who should be making decisions about how resources are spent uh, is important. But the point is that, you know, if one in five people have a disability, um, the question is about what we are doing with all our resources. So while, you know, as the Equalities Minister, I can point to the Equalities Budget, can point to the Third Sector Budget, but it, it's actually about the spend right across government in education and in health and ensuring that, particularly with those large universal services, that those who are disadvantaged in some way are getting the, their fair share of core services and core resources so that the additional resources we have in terms of equality budgets, that that actually uh, adds value. So I wouldn't for one minute demure from the importance of investment uh, and continued investment, but there is something quite fundamental about that this is what we should be doing anyway. You know, we all want more of a resource. Uh, but irrespective of the size of the resource, this is about uh, attitudes, it's about culture, it's about how we deploy resources, it's about how we uh, prioritise resources. And I, I suppose what I'm trying to uh, delicately point at, you know, people can't say, we're not doing this unless you give us extra money. Actually, you know, we all have to do this and it's all our business and we have to ensure that, you know, all the arrows across the massive investment uh, that is made across the public sector, uh, that that is all directed uh, in, in the right direction. Thank you. I think therein lies the rub, really, doesn't it? It's about matching rhetoric with reality. And um, this is an issue which really we, we do well to take party politics out of and I think work, try to work together on. Um, I think one of the challenges for us, and you mentioned it in your opening remarks, in terms of particularly those transitions and in particular moving young people with disabilities from education into employment is one of the biggest challenges in our community. A significant metropolitan authority, who I won't name, in Scotland, um, declared in its 2011 single outcome agreement that it wanted to get 200 um, 17 to 19 year olds with a disability into the workplace by the, by the next iteration of its single outcome agreement. When that iteration came around, it turned out it had only succeeded in managing to get 11 17 to 19 year olds with a disability into employment, but nothing happened. I mean, that's a, a separate problem with the single outcome process, uh, agreement process. There was no sanction, there was no kind of accountability for that. Uh, but I think, it, I think it very elegantly delineates the problem before us that we all agree in the political classes that we need to do more to uh, break those barriers down and to help young people who have so much to contribute even though they may have a disability, into the workplace. Um, but that, that is a significant challenge. I just wonder, um, what can we do differently that we haven't been doing so far that will close that gap? One of the things that 
Uh, myself and Jean Freeman have worked very hard on when we were pulling together the Fairer Scotland Action Plan and the Disability Delivery Plan was to ensure that the actions were indeed actions and not just uh, rhetoric, because it's, it's very easy to talk about our ambitions, uh, our philosophy, our approach. And what you will see uh, in both the Fear of Scotland Action Plan and the Disability Delivery Plan is you know, actions that are actually about doing things, uh, and in some cases, doing things differently. And, you know, in terms of, you know, our other partners, in terms of, you know, uh, the various types of outcome agreements that there are within the university sector or indeed, you know, local authorities, it is important that they, you know, evolve over time where we're actually focused on what it is we're going to do as well as uh, what, what, what we're saying. And there is something important about scrutiny, um, about saying, you know, what is your ambition, what you're going to do and you know, not just publishing a plan and then moving on and to see what's next. You know, you have to stick with it and you have to stick with it uh, for the long haul. You have to be monitoring your progress. You have to understand uh, your, your, your data, um, you know, because that leads to transparency. So we know that in that particular instance for that local authority, that they've not met their ambition so therefore, there is scrutiny about that, there is transparency about that, which I hope will lead to redress of that, and it leads people to think about what more uh, they can and must do. Thank you. Thank you. Jeremy. Um, thank you, and uh, thank you very much for coming. I mean, I think there's cross-party support on this whole issue around transition, and I think what the Cabinet Secretary has said this morning is very helpful. And, and I think particularly for those with a fairly severe disabled learning difficulty or physical disability, how we work with them and their educational school to get them in, I think is something that we do need to do work on, but I'm grateful for the comments that she's made this morning. My question is actually aimed at the Minister. Um, we've heard quite a lot in the last few weeks that universities, I think, are trying to um, open the doors more to those with disability but there does seem to be a, almost a hierarchy of disability. That if you have a certain disability, it's reasonably easy, comparatively, to get in. Where if you have a more complex disability, it's really quite difficult to get in. Um, and I wonder, without committing any financial money to this, whether there would be some kind of research that the government would be looking to do, along with universities, of saying not just disability, how many disabled people are in. We've got the breakdown already of the different types of disability, but what can we do then to help those who have that maybe complex disability get into university or into college? And how do we encourage colleges and universities uh, to do that? Thank you. You raise a very important point about the, the good practice that is going on within higher education institutions. And, and I saw from the submission from University Scotland that they detailed some of that good practice. Um, I think what we have is good practice, and I think that needs to be embedded um, across the board. Um, part of that um, lies out with it being a university um, and actually on to some of the, mm. the aspects that the Cabinet Secretary mentioned about a cultural change um, and also the statutory obligations that a university has. Um, it's an anticipatory duties uh, to look at what they are delivering and how they are <coughs> delivering it. So I think there's a lot more that can be done to question and to analyse what's going on, which won't only help those with um, a disability, but will also help um, students from different backgrounds, those with caring responsibilities and so on. So I think there is an obligation within each university to actually take a step back and analyse that. Now, I, I think they're, they're, they're doing that um, and the, the statutory obligations that they have uh, should ensure uh, that that very much happens and where the government and the funding council can come in to facilitate uh, that discussion um, and to ensure that that good practice is shared. I think there's a very important role in that. But I also took a lot from the evidence that you heard from committee about that it's not just enough to speak to those that are at university, but those who feel that they are unable to apply or unable to uh, receive sufficient support when they get there. And I think we have lessons to learn on all of that, some of which are for the universities as autonomous institutions, and some of which are very much for government to take on board. 
we, we have outcome agreements, and we've just been talking about them a bit this morning uh, with a panel before you. Yeah. Uh, they feel slightly, somebody who's fairly new to this, uh, lots of carrots, but not many sticks. Uh, and I do wonder whether we need to maybe rebalance how we address the outcome agreements. But yes, we want to encourage, and yes, we want to show good practice, but maybe there needs to be a bit of a stick there if, you, if institutions, and particularly faculties, I mean, again, I think the issue seems to be at the top level, the principal, the court, absolutely buy into it. But you go down to the lecture in what subject, there, that's the individual which is causing a problem to a disabled student. So, again, looking at this going forward, without being too cruel, can we have some sticks? <laughs> Well, I think out outcome agreements um, are, are quite a, a new concept still. I think they've delivered a lot, both for universities and colleges, to ensure that we are looking at the outcomes um, and to have that baseline analysis, which is very, very important. It is, because it's new, I think it's only right that um, we periodically take a step back and review those and we're going through that process with uh, the funding council at the moment to see whether there's a necessarily a, a different way of doing things and to see where they can be strengthened. It's also very important that they are effective, Mr Balfour is, is, is um, quite correct, they shouldn't just be a document that sits on the shelf and that we have discussions about but that something follows from that. And the Funding Council and the Scottish Government have a variety of um, funds which we, um, we can uh, give to different universities, for example, on widening access. Um, and if we need to, to learn from how we um, facilitate those funds and how those funds um, are um, distributed amongst the institutions, then the outcome agreements and, and how those uh, um, are actually implemented is very, very important that. So I do take his point, there needs to be both carrots um, and sticks, and I'm open to, uh, during the review of the outcome agreements, to see whether we've got that balance right or not, because I think it's only right that we do take a step back and have a look at that. Thank you. We've got some comments here. Convener, um, with your indulgence, I thought it might be quite useful to say something about public sector uh, equality duties, um, because the, the, the general duty under the Equality Act uh, talks about how public authorities, and in this instance, you know, it includes uh, universities, that whilst they're exercising their functions, they have to uh, be eliminating unlawful discrimination, they have to be in the business of advancing equality of opportunity, uh, as well as fostering good relationships uh, between those with and without protected characteristics. Now, that, all of that points to um, the need for a, a proactive response. And the public sector equality duties that are listed uh, within the specific uh, duties uh, regulations, for example, say uh, undertake equality impact assessments on new or revised policies and practices and to publish the results. And I think that's uh, an important strand of the duties that uh, you know, all um, education um, institutions are subject to in terms of you know, transparency of what they're doing uh, and to assist with the, the, the evaluation of that. In terms of the Scottish Government's responsibilities, um, our responsibility um, is to, to help uh, public authorities uh, exercise their responsibilities uh, in terms of the, the quality uh, outcomes. And we do have a project, SNEEP, um, Scottish National <laughs> Equality Improvement uh, Project. Um, and th this is about you know, our partnership you know, with the EHRC, uh, uh, Close the Gap, the Equality Network, about how we can bring forward a programme of work that helps the public sector fulfil uh, their duties. So we're currently considering the work plan for 2017. So as well as, as a government reflecting on what we need to uh, do in terms of our disability delivery plan and result of committee's deliberations, there's also you know, the opportunity in terms of SNEEP, in terms of what we do as a government to help you know, aspects of the public sector uh, you know, comply with their very clear uh, duties. So, you know, there is, there is a, a stream of work uh, that, you know, that government and indeed our partners need to be uh, very focused on. I think it's also worth saying that it's the, the Equality and Human Rights Commission that are the regulatory uh, body uh, for uh, the public sector, you know, complying with, with, with their act as well. So there's a lot we can do as a government, uh, but we also have to respect uh, the, the role of the, the EHRC as well. Jeremy, you're fine, thank you. Um, 
Mary. Um, and can I echo the, um, the, the comments that my colleague Jeremy Balfour has made? Because I too would like to see a bit more stick and a bit less carrot. Um, because if I reflect the, the evidence that we've heard in the last few weeks, um, there is a, a recognition and, a, and an acknowledgement that universities and higher education institutes need to do more. They recognise that they have students that have a, a varying range of, of disabilities and they should be supporting them. But unless it's a soft disability, um, it becomes very, very difficult. Mm. And, and the, the, the length to which students need to go to get the support they require is simply not acceptable. Um, and, and I welcome the words from the Cabinet Secretary this morning around the disability delivery plan when you talk about actions. And I come back to the carrot and stick. Because if you have actions, you must have consequences. And I wonder if you could perhaps expand a bit on what you would expect those consequences to, to, to look like. Because um, if I reflect on a question that I asked in the previous panel, the University of Edinburgh did a study in 2004 on disabled students in higher education. And many of the things that come out of that study we have heard in our evidence in the last few weeks. There have been a number of action plans published. There have been a number of recommendations made. But 12 years down the line, things have not improved. So unless a disability delivery plan actually has teeth and sticks, it would appear that nothing much is going to change. So I would like a, a, a reassurance and perhaps an indication of what those consequences might look like. I mean, that's a very, very broad uh, question and, you, you know, we'll have um, a different shape and scope depending on the different portfolios that are involved in delivering uh, the delivery plan um, and that will be reflected in the, the different statutory responsibilities uh, that colleagues across the, the government have. Um, I'm very clear about what the law says. Uh, and although, you know, it's the uh, Equality and Human Rights Commission that is the regulator for non-compliance uh, with the, the, the Equality Act, uh, I think it's important that as government in our work with our partners that none of us are defensive about this, that we all accept that there is more to do, that we all look for the opportunities uh, to, to, to pick up the pace, um, it's quite difficult to talk about sanctions uh, without being specific about specific actions and an acknowledgement about where the specific powers on specific things uh, rely. I suppose we have to be conscious that sanctions can, of course, be uh, counterproductive, uh, but sometimes you know, they can be um, effective. Um, there are, of course, a range of activities you can undertake as a government. It's not always about financial <laughs> sanctions, which tends to be what, 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 what springs to mind. But, I mean, if I can say to you, as the Cabinet Secretary for Equalities, I'm very clear about what the law says. Uh, that applies to the government. We are under scrutiny uh, about that. There are things that we need to do better, uh, you know, on this journey in, in terms of, you know, incorporate, you know, really incorporating uh, a human rights uh, approach to, to all our actions in terms of how we take forward uh, our programme for government commitments, about how we uh, engage with people, about how we can embed further economic, social and cultural rights. You know, and some of this journey won't be comfortable either for government uh, nor our partners. But you know, a light needs to be shed in it uh, and we need to face up to our discomfort and to, to focus on uh, actions uh, that, that will, that will make, make life better. Yeah, I think the Minister wanted to, to come back in, but Minister, on the back of Mary's question this morning, I asked the Funding Council about the Disabled Students Premium, how they, those decisions are made and how the funding is allocated and, and really whether it's right, ring-fenced or not. Um, and on, on, on the sort of a back of Mary's question, could that be a carrot and a stick <laughs> and used to, 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 you know, enable change? I, I think that the premium is a... Um, is, is an, an interesting budget that, um, I, again, with the review of uh, student support going on, which is looking at um, the, the student support that we have, including uh, for all students, including those with disabilities. Um, I had already um, s um, said um, that I was open to that review, not just looking at the student support in terms of the allowance, but does that premium 
support students with disabilities and if it doesn't we need to question if it's going in the right direction if it's being used correctly so um, that that um, message had had already been given f um, from me to the review to to uh, when they were looking at the support for disabled students to analyze that premium yeah. so I'm more than um, um, happy to see what comes out of that review and indeed feed anything in that comes from the committee's work um, where they feel that questions have been raised about that. I think the review group, I, it's an independent review, it's not for me to set their work plan, but it's already been highlighted to them um, as an issue. Um, I also thought it, it might be helpful to look at one of the specific action points that is in the delivery plan uh, went to do with uh, SAS and the, the workings of, of SAS. Now, one of my... Uh, first meetings as a minister and one of the first visits I went on um, was to the Students Awards Agency and heard a presentation there um, from Who Care Scotland and someone uh, from a care and experience background who went through how SAS had discussed with them how they had changed their entire application process to ensure that it worked for them and it was very much um, the change was very much led by users of the system um, and Who Care Scotland were therefore um, you know, a, a lot more happy with the outcomes and the way that care experienced young people are dealt with through SAS. Now there's an action point about disabled um, students going through that application process and SAS looking at that um, and analysing whether anything needs to change in that. And I certainly was greatly heartened by the work that that agency had done with people with uh, care experience backgrounds um, and will look very closely at what they do uh, when it comes to disabled students um, and with that action point in mind. But, but I certainly took great heart from the work they've already done and the very proactive way that they engaged with individuals um, and with people to, to see whether that system worked and really tested it out. And I think we've now got a system where in the, that aspect it is much better and we can look at that for disabled students going forward. So that's one action point which I'm, I'm, I'm very confident that SAS will deliver on. Mary. Okay, thank you. Because I mean, I'm, I'm sure nobody that's sitting around this table wants to think that in 10 years' time another committee will be looking at this issue, mm -hmm. and and we'll, we'll be talking about the things that we've talked about <laughs> in, in the last few weeks, and that that's why it's so important that any delivery plan um, actually does deliver meaningful change. So I, I appreciate the comments you've made. Thank you. Holly Coffee. Thanks very much, convener. I wonder if I could um, go back to the admissions process itself. I've raised this at every meeting of the committee <coughs> that we've had and the part that the personal statement makes and has in that process. Uh, John Kemp from the Funding Council just before you came in said there's no direct monitoring of that aspect of the admissions process so that, so that we can see that that meets all our obligations in respect of equality of, of access. But then Fiona Burns, who came after, spoke after John, said that we are, there is some process underway to examine that, that process of looking at non-academic <coughs> factors in the contextualised admissions process. So I wonder, if, could you tell us a wee bit more about this so that we can get some kind of understanding of how and whether that aspect of the admissions process is actually a fair process? I think it would very much help for the entire admissions process to be a lot clearer and more transparent. And it's one of the aspects which I think it would not only help disabled students, but would help uh, students uh, or potential students from a variety of backgrounds, whether that's from a, a socioeconomic perspective um, or, or um, you know, a variety of different demographics. So I think there is a requirement for uh, more transparency to allow um, those who are looking to a college or university to be able to understand the options that are open to them um, and they can make a, a choice uh, where they would like to study based on the best information. Uh, personal statements were looked for by the Commission um, for widening access um, and it is something which is um, an area um, of concern because they can often be difficult for those from um, a socio-economic deprived background um, to be able to complete in a way that um, those from a more advantaged background would be able to complete. So personal statements and non-academic um, 
um, statements do have to be looked at and we do have to be very clear about what role they should or should not play and I would expect the Commissioner um, to look at that when they're looking at the admissions um, policy. Contextualised admissions um, are somewhat broader than that. Um, personal statements are, are only one aspect that could be part of a contextualised admissions. Um, so you can therefore look at, at, at different gradings, uh, for example, for the same course, depending on um, what a person's background is. And that's a different type of contextualised admission that does and should play um, an, an, a more important role in admissions. But it, uh, Mr Coffey is um, very correct to say that that should be done in a very transparent way. There is no point any institution having a process that people don't understand um, and therefore they can't take advantage of. So the requirement for transparency is very, very important. The admissions process for each university is, as an autonomous institution is up to that university. Uh, but we do have... Um, a certain uh, basic understanding about what that should look like and that should be it should be open and transparent easily understandable and allow a fair process of admissions so that people can access university do you think do you think we'll be able to see per university the, the data perhaps being gathered over the next few years about how they are treating this process so that so that we can have a look and see that and come to a view that there is an objective and fair method of treating this? Do you think we'll see that? I think we'll have to, and I think part of the work of the Commissioner as they go forward um, will be to challenge the government and to challenge the institutions. And, and admissions is a very, very important part of that process. Um, it's, in, you know, after all, the, the, the kind of gateway into the university. So that will play a very, very important part of the, the Commissioner's work uh, going forward, I'm sure. Um, remind me, correct me if I'm wrong, but the target by 2021 is that 10% of students should come from 20% of the more disadvantaged backgrounds, and that's at every university. And there was some good news reported this morning where the figure's 10.9%, but that's overall. When will all of those universities, do you think, meet this target? If you look at the data that we have presently, Four of the universities, Robert Gordon's, Aberdeen, Edinburgh and St Andrews, have never reached 10% in the previous 10 years. So what work will, be, will the Scottish Government be doing to encourage those universities to meet this target and to deliver on that, for, particularly for students within that category? Well, you're correct to say that the figures that were released today show that we are at a historic high for those that are coming from the most deprived communities. Uh, but we're in, uh, by no means complacent about that because we are by far um, still short of the targets that we've set, both for higher education in general and for each um, institution. Um, every institution um, is coming from a, a different starting point. Some of them will find it more challenging than others. Um, but they are all obligated to reach those targets and they have all signed up to it. Now, there are some um, aspects that will be easy for them to be able to put into place. There will be some aspects that will be more challenging. And I think that was one of the very important reasons why the Commission report suggested that we did have an independent commissioner uh, that can drive that forward, independent from government, um, and, and we'll be able to challenge both the government and the institutions to do that. So asking for a timescale about when each individual institution um, will be able to reach that target, I, I wouldn't be able to, to, to give for each institution, but we have set that target for each of them to reach that 10% um, and all the sector has signed up to it and, and we will very much work uh, towards the establishment of that uh, becoming a reality. Now we do fund widening access um, places but this, um, I go back to one of the, the points that Russell Gunson made in his evidence about this being an attitudinal and cultural change um, that is required within higher education um, and that will require a greater step change than, than we're seeing at the moment and at a greater pace. And for some institutions that will be challenging but they are obligated to do so. Could I just finally ask that if they don't meet this target, I know it's by 2021 and that's five years from now but my friends were interested in carrots and sticks today. <laughs> I mean, if they don't meet the target, what would be, be likely to do would be, be 
thinking about funding arrangements and making adjustments there, or just exactly what we need? Because we have to be serious about this. This, mm -hmm. this is an equalities committee. We want to see progress on this, and we don't want to be sitting here another five years with the same messages. Mm -hmm. what, what would we think about doing to make sure we deliver that target? Well, I, I fully appreciate that we need to deliver the target. This is a, a, an important priority for the government and for the, the education ministers um, in particular. Um, there are carrots and sticks to this approach. We do already fund um, widening access um, places. We do have a number of policies in place uh, to support that. Um, but we will see over time whether that needs uh, to change. I think uh, for some institutions, as I said, it will be easier than, than others um, and we will have to look at the different outcome agreements that we have um, and the different arrangements that we have in place for, for those um, universities. Uh, but I hope the committee can be in no doubt about how serious the government takes this as a political priority um, and how passionate the Commissioner will be to drive this forward as well. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Hi, good morning. Um, it's a question from this morning as well. We're saying we want equality for, for everyone, in, um, especially in the application process, to get into universities. What we don't, we had a, a witness in who was a BSL user who said that he found it very difficult to complete his application in written English because it's not how he communicates with people. Um, and when we're looking at um, personal statements, would there be or can there be an opportunity for these personal statements to be made either using BSL or in other forms like video or something like that for, for people who have got other disabilities um, and that would make it a fairer process for people to actually get into university courses? Well, I think the Cabinet Secretary has already mentioned some of the statutory requirements that are on the universities and, and applications is, is very much an important part of that. Um, we simply can't have a process um, which is, you know, by all means, you know, closed to certain parts of the population because of the, the language which they use. Um, so the application process needs to be open to all. And I, I read with great concern the, the um, personal statements um, and some of the witnesses that you've had forward from you about their difficulties um, of uh, filling in the application process, but also actually the stage before that about not even feeling that it was for them that they should bother um, trying to apply. Um, so there's a cultural change that we need to do within our schools, not just within the universities, but within the schools, within careers advice, um, and a systems change that we have to look at to ensure that disabled um, pupils, when they're still at school, uh, do feel supported and encouraged to know that they can apply to the universities, uh, but then that the universities uh, fulfil the obligations to ensure that that application process is open to all. Cabinet Secretary. I mean, maybe just to add, um, I mean, this Parliament's well aware that uh, BSL by law has to be treated and respected as a, a minority language. Mm. Uh, and in terms of uh, the overall uh, public sector uh, and general e equality duties, we have to be very proactive uh, and actually flexible mm. uh, about how we uh, make sure that we turn uh, words uh, into actions as well. And I'll just point to uh, a couple of specific actions uh, in relation to higher education uh, from the, the Disability uh, Delivery Plan. Uh, one is the, the Student Awards Agency will work in partnership with disabled students and stakeholders to deliver, and it says, an increasingly accessible application process. Uh, so you know, that, that should include, uh, you know, a, a range of methods uh, of enabling people uh, to communicate uh, and they will improve, you know, the advice and guidance uh, in and around that area, you know, for all students uh, with additional support needs uh, and in particular uh, students with a, a, a disability. There's also, uh, from 2017, uh, the Scottish Funding Council that the outcome agreement guidance, and this again is mentioned in the Disability Delivery Plan, it will require colleges and universities to produce an access and inclusion uh, strategy as well that will define their inclusive practices. So that's about being quite specific again uh, about what you will do uh, to, to reach your, your aspirations. Just, just on the back of that, how, how would we measure that? How will it be measured? Well, I mean, again, that's part of any uh, outcome uh, 
agreement process that you know the, the, the plan is clearly articulated. It's helpful if it's specific as possible, so it's therefore easier uh, to measurable. It needs to be published, you know, any evaluation uh, or progress reports so that there is uh, you know transparency as well. Um, and in terms of you know that balance between you know, carrots um, and sticks. Uh, it's a very, very, very festive convener. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, I think, I think it's... <laughs> we could change it to mince pies and snowballs if you prefer. <laughs> um, you know, I think it's important that, you know, we need to be keeping, you know, an eye on the ball, you know, considering our options, both in terms of carrots uh, and sticks uh, as we move forward. You know, carrots and sticks are not just for, for Christmas. Um, and, you know, actually, at the end of the day, be focused on what works, you know, what, what, what will work. Uh, and as a government, you, you, we have the right to be, you know, considering on a case-by-case -case basis, you know, what sanctions uh, would be helpful in actually moving uh, a particular agenda forward. Thank you. If I can just add to that yeah. as, as well, that one of the, the other aspects that we're obviously looking into is, is having discussions with UCAS about the application process from their point of view too. So uh, I think between the, the different stakeholders um, that the kind of Cabinet Secretary is pointing to there, uh, there are discussions ongoing, um, particularly on this issue. Um, so hopefully that, that um, gives the, the members some, some reassurance that those discussions are ongoing um, and that we are looking to ensure that, um, particularly with the, um, the legislation that's went um, forward in Scotland with BSL, that we have a, a process that fulfils those obligations and those discussions with UCAS can continue as well. Yeah, the, the other side of that argument that, that Annie Wells had, had uh, brought up this morning as well is about exams and, and being able to do exams in BSL um, if English isn't your first language. So I would hope that would be something you could add to your extens extensive list. Just a very final question uh, to, to both of you. The predecessor committee, the Equal Opportunities Committee in session four, commended equality impact assessments. I have to say I've got a bit of a bugbear about equality impact assessments because they're only as good as the quality of the information contained therein. So I, think, I suppose our question is how you know the quality impact assessment uh, process is used to ensure that anything that is contained in the draft budget doesn't then have a negative impact on on their their, their qualities um, uh, programs going forward I mean in, in terms of um, a broad approach in terms of our equality budget um, process um, it's something that we've gained considerable um, experience on now um, this is the eighth year that we've uh, included as part of our budget process the, the, the quality uh, budget statement. Uh, we are helped in that process by independent people. This isn't just you know, internal government people. Uh, COSLA are involved, academics are involved, uh, the Joseph uh, Rowntree Foundation are involved. Um, and I agree that you know, equality impact assessments uh, are dependent on the quality uh, of information and the preci precision of information yeah. that is contained in them. And some stakeholders would say that Scotland is a, a world leader uh, in this process, but I have absolutely you know, no doubt that as we progress, that you know, it's a process that has to evolve, it, it, has, to, it has to be uh, refined, and we have to learn from the experience of, of doing it in the past uh, and, and apply that to the future. Yeah. yeah. I think that exhausts our evidence to, to this morning, right, right on the button for timing, because I know that you have questions in the chamber soon. Um, just at, at the end of the session, we, we're obviously the focus of this inquiry is about the budget and how the money is spent and, and the outcome of that money being spent and whether it actually works or not. Obviously, that's the very narrow focus of this inquiry. But the broader focus of the committee around equalities, uh, duties, human rights, you know, a rights-based approach, there may be elements that have arisen from the evidence that we've taken that we would pursue uh, uh, you know, in a wider context, are you all okay for us to continue to write to you to seek clarification or, or information and advice on some of that work? <laughs> always happy to oblige, <laughs> convener. Always. Indeed. Yep. <laughs> Merry Christmas. <laughs> uh, can thank you both for, for your attendance at the committee this morning. Very thank well. your officials thank too. You. Um, we really appreciate your, your attendance here this morning. So thank you very much. And that allows us to move on to uh, agenda item three, which is scrutiny of the draft budget. And we'll take that item in private. So I now close this session of the committee.